very much for the invitation to this interesting conference and I think it's good to be the last speaker, not to have the last word, but because I can already refer to a lot of the facts and uh, opinions that were raised here uh, in the morning. But let me introduce the Economic and Social Committee first to you, I guess. This is the slides. We are the House of Civil Society in Europe and we are a consultative body that is composed out of 350 members from all member states that are proposed by the national governments and nominated by the Council and the role in the treaties is to advise the European institutions in their policies. And what does organized civil society mean? We are all people from the ground in our professions working and we are composed of three groups. The first group are employer organizations from all Europe, from all 28 member states. We have the workers group and I happen to be the president of this group. And these are trade unionists uh, from all over Europe. And we have the group three of various interest. Here we have farmers, women's organizations, welfare organizations, a lot of expertise pooled together from a practical point of view to advise the institutions. How are we working? We are asked. In, on certain proposals of legislation to give our opinion and come up with concrete recommendations. But we can also do in certain areas where we see lack of policies to own initiative opinions or can be asked by other institutions. To do it short, but I think it's good to understand the recommendations we are doing. We, we work in study groups with members of all three groups and we work on a consensus basis when we come up with concrete proposals in the end. Um, we vote on it in plenary sessions and then we transfer these opinions to the institutions. So we have a variety of opinions concerning gender equality, not only for women in different professions or as entrepreneurs or on the gender pay gap or on women in research. And I will just refer to some of them because in the end I want to give some of the concrete recommendations we did. So um, improving gender equality in general I see it and we see it as a part of coming out of the crisis of the European Union. And you heard from the Gender Institute here already, and I will refer also to, um, to some of the um, research they did. I want to go back here. Um, they say that, uh, pointed out already, that um, yes, the European Union is a good place to live for women, but it's only sort of halfway towards a real gender equal society. And if you look at different facts, you can see we have a gender equality index in the European Union and the average score at the moment, or rather a bit older in 2012, was 53 out of 100. And if you look at the different domains, we can see in the work domain uh, with a score of 62, it reveals that women are still less likely to participate in the labor market than men. In the money area, it confirms that women are at an economic disadvantage still. And as regards to knowledge, gender segregation in educational fields remains still quite high. And I did find it very interesting to see the data and to see that we made some progress, but that at the moment we are sort of at a point where it's rather more stagnation, but not the changes we would need to have. You can say the same in the time parameter. It shows that women are still disproportionately responsible for caring in our societies and that a fairer division of time would help to make the important changes. And if you look at the power domain, um, we see that we still have very low levels of equality in decision making, particular in the economic area. 
I have to say I was very pleased today to hear the results of the British election that in the UK with today we have more women than ever in the Parliament of the UK, more than 200 women and I think we also have to celebrate the steps we are doing uh, in this direction. But what we can see really, and this is also important for the STEM debate, is that the countries that have a higher score in gender equality also invest much more in research and innovation than the countries that have lower scores. So we are very active here to come up with concrete recommendations. And in the same way as also the Gender Institute, we think that this is not a debate for gender experts but that this is a debate about a good future of the European Union because what we can see is that um, with a better gender equality policy on a European and national level, we would have strong GDP impacts over the time. You can see that hopefully here. <laughs> And that we can see also in terms of increased productivities, policies to support this uh, will be essential. Um, and if we look at the European Union, we can see that it would, if it would have a stronger and more coherent gender strategy and especially better interlinked policies that are gendered, this could help to overcome the crisis and therefore gender policies could be seen as part of the solution and not as part of a problem or a challenge or an obstacle. Unfortunately, when we look at the debates at the moment there's a broad debate on the future of Europe. We have five scenarios there. Gender equality does not play any significant role uh, in these scenarios. So it's more important how this will impact on autonomous cars than mentioning the question of gender equality. And we are convinced that this has to be changed um, soon. So um, I also would like to refer um, to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals because here all member states um, that signed agreed also that with the goal number five, gender equality for example, or the goal number eight, decent work and economic growth, that, this, um, that here we need new policies to, to uh, perform better here. We have good news, and I think you saw the data here, that in most European countries, young women are doing better in education and have a higher enrollment rates to tertiary education than young men. And um, according to Eurostat data in 2015, 28% of the EU female population from the age bracket 15 to 64 had a tertiary education degree, while the same proportion of males was 24.7. However, and it was referred here, and I will not repeat this, um, we still have important inequalities between boys and girls in terms of fields of education chosen, and that we look at the STEM field, um, and we saw the new figures, I did find it very interesting. Um, we can see that there is some progress in some member states, but that the situation is very diverse between the different member states. But we already know that we need much more women in STEM to bridge the gap and to achieve the goals we have uh, on European level and therefore it will be key how to come up with proposals and policies um, to achieve more progress here. Because it is not only at individual level that if you are lagging behind in STEM may translate in lower employment prospects and we know that the poverty rates in Europe are the highest for for young people, for women, and especially for women with small children, and that they will have lower earnings uh, in the labor market, a higher economic dependence, and less development. So not only from an individual perspective, this is important to change, um, also to, to close the gender pay gap, but at aggregate level we can see that this will have huge implications on productivity, on employment in Europe, and on economic growth.
and therefore reducing the gender gap in STEM education could help us in the European Union to reduce the bottlenecks we have in the labour market now and that we can already see for the future to increase employment and productivity of women and to reduce occupational segregation as much as the gender pay gap. So, future gender equality measures can bring a considerable change in the gender education gap. One point that was also referred here, and here our committee did some very concrete proposals, is that uh, women in the STEM place a high value on career advancement opportunities, and that it's various stages in their life including the critical mid-career times when they often drop out of the workforce, they value work-life design elements more than career developments. And according to statistical data of the US, women value much more than men flexible working arrangements and childcare support. Also in the EU, the work-life issue is and remains a key element and also here the situation is very different in the member states and therefore we say um, as a committee there is not just a glass ceiling but also what we call a maternal wall hindering the career of female researchers and for this reason it is very good that the commission proposed in April a new package which is called a pillar of social rights which also includes new legal proposals how to bridge uh, and to improve the work-life balance and improve possibilities to um, not only to parental leave, because this should address not only women, but in the same way men, and also for caring for older people, uh, parts of your family, um, etc. So, and this would bring, and this is a recent study by Eurofound, um, Europe a staggering 370 billion a year if they would really enable more women to participate in the labor market, and this would be a big step ahead. But until then, we need the agreement of all uh, member states for this package uh, and to come up really um, with a compromise between Parliament uh, and the Council. And what we raised in our first opinion on the pillar of social rights that we said for us, gender equality is a central element of securing fair working conditions for all. And up to now, this is not seen in the way we would like to have it. And the second point we stressed, and here I will refer again um, to the data we have seen from the Gender Institute, is that we say for us it is key that we have new European policies on better and fairer transitions because this we can see is one of the problems we have to address that we secure a good transition from university into your first job from job to job from unemployment in have a look what qualifications are needed and that we would use the European funds much better, for example, to qualify people while they're working maybe part-time and in the other half to have the necessary training to enter in new professions or in new jobs. Um, and this will be key to continue to discuss and to come up really with concrete proposals here. What are our recommendations really concerning the, the STEM? That uh, we did an opinion on women in research and we, we recommended the following general measures. That we said you have to address the gender disparities in education by promoting a change of attitude among students. We heard a little bit about how easy or how hard it is to change attitudes of teachers, parents and society at large and for us it is very key that these interventions should start very early in a student's life because what we can see in the research is that stereotypical perceptions and attitudes set in towards what boys and girls excel in and enjoy doing. 
that we need more statistics broken down by gender because they will give us a clearer understanding of the situation of women in the professional sectors linked to new technologies or the level of use of such technologies. You saw Rex the complex data but I think it would be very good also to look into sectors and to see the difference and to see why some countries perform better and others not and what can be learned from this experience. Also improving women's participation in science, technology, engineering and STEM. And here it's for us very important as we entered what we call the digital era that we really put a particular focus on digital education for women who are still underrepresented in IT jobs and that we link these debates we have on digitalization with the one on gender equality, which is not done yet at all. Because we have, for example, digital common market strategies, and I don't think they even include the word gender. And that we have to pay special attention to initiatives and projects funded like the Erasmus program, which just celebrated its birthday, to see how can we encourage more women to participate in these programs and how we can put more emphasis and also pressure to make sure that women participate here in the same level and especially also in certain um, fields of education. Um, what we ask the Commission to do is to collect and disseminate the sex disaggregated data related to research and innovation within the Eurostat framework. This is also very important and that they should propose a recommendation to member states with common guidelines on institutional change to promote gender equalities in universities and research institutions, and that they should continue developing and implementing awareness programs aimed at attracting more girls into the STEM fields, and that they should fund this and doing more research here ensuring greater cooperation between the relevant commission directorates. That's a problem that we have the ones responsible for gender equality proposing certain things and then in the main core fields they continue without a real gender perspective and this has to be addressed. And that we say we have to appeal to the member states to ensure that their expenditure on research and development really reaches the 3% of GDP that's promised and with the crisis we can see this is not happening um, and this will be a very important. 610 to 820 billion in 2015. And closing the gender gap in STEM will also have a positive impact on employment. It would raise to 1 million and 200. And the new jobs are likely to be highly productive because women graduating from STEM often progress into high value added positions in sectors such as information and communication or financial and business services. And closing the gender gap in STEM will also increase women's confidence and allow them to gain more responsibility at work and progress into leadership positions. This would reduce the vertical gender segregation would <coughs> uh, and, and would be of big impact. So this is why we think in the committee that we have to link much more the debate on the future of Europe and on a pillar of social rights with the opportunities of better gender equality in the European Union and that we have to link much more the debate on the challenges of digitalization and the opportunities with more women in STEM. And in our view, it is the EU that will profit from it. It's the citizens, the women and men of Europe that would profit and business would profit too.